who would who else would you include on on the Mount Rushmore of of, of trap? I feel like I would stand on the throne by myself. In the 2010s, trap music exploded in popularity, so much so that it went from being a niche hip-hop genre to being the backbone of some of the most popular songs of the past decade. This video won't be a history lesson on trap as a genre or every trap artist to ever live, but more so a dive into its popularity in the 2010s and how that came to be. If you're unfamiliar with trap, I'll link a playlist down below, but I promise you've heard it before. Let's get into it. So first, it's important to understand what trap music is and where it comes from. Trap music originated in Atlanta in the 1980s. Trap is a subgenre of hip hop characterized by double and triple time hi-hats, 808s, brass, snares, and kick drums. It's said to be a blend of hip hop, EDM, and dub music. Typically, the beat will be at the forefront just as much as the lyrics in trap music. Layers of varying tempos keep the music engaging as there are several elements to absorb and focus on. Traditionally, the subject matter in trap music was related to hustling, urban violence, and the sale and use of drugs. The word trap actually comes from the Atlanta slang word, referring to places where drugs were made and sold, colloquially known as a trap or a trap house. In the early to mid-2000s, some of the leaders and innovators of trap included Jeezy, 3-6 Mafia, Gucci Mane, and T.I., who actually coined the term trap with his 2003 album Trap Music. About this, T.I. said, with the exception of Outkast and Let Me Think Goody Mob, with the exception of that, before I came in the game, it was Lil Jon, Outkast, Goody Mob, okay. So you had crunk music and you had organized noise. There is no such thing as trap music. I created that. I coined the term. It was my second album, Trap Music. It dropped in 2003. After that, there was an entire new genre of music created. An open lane for each of you to do what you do and live your lives on TV and be accepted by the masses. The masses have accepted you because I opened the door and you walked through it. Don't forget who opened that door, cuz. Moving into the 2010s, the sound known as modern trap music was popularized by artists and producers like Lil Jon, Lex Luger, and the rest of 808 Mafia. Some of Luger's popular collaborators of the time period include Waka Flocka Flame, Rick Ross, Ace Hood, Kanye West, and Jay-Z. Trap music at this time was characterized by its blaring and maximalist production. I might be showing my age here, but the first trap or southern hip hop trap crossover song I remember going huge was No Hands. I think I was like in 7th or 8th grade at the time. The song came out in 2010, which makes sense because it coincides with when trap exploded into a more mainstream genre and began to chart regularly on Billboard. Some categorize No Hands as simply southern hip hop, while others classify it more narrowly as just trap. I would honestly put the song in both categories. On the surface, it sounds much closer to Southern hip hop, but you can definitely hear Trap too. The song comes from Waka Flocka's 2010 album, Flock of Veli, which is said to have helped determine the direction of the trap subgenre. The site Hip Hop Golden Age considers it the first trap album, calling songs released before Flock of Veli pre trap and those released after post trap. Personally, I'm not sure if I agree with this because other artists like Gucci Mane were already making trap music. Perhaps not modern trap, which took off in the 2010s, but it was still trap music. Regardless, Flockavelli further crystallized trap as a subgenre of southern hip hop, one characterized by bombastic beats, synths, and aggressive yet charismatic rapping. Due to its popularity, trap began to influence other forms of hip hop as well as pop music. Often, this just meant using a trap beat in a song rather than making actual references to trapping. In 2012, Nicki Minaj dropped Bees in the Trap with Two Chains. Though the song is heavily electropop, trap can be heard in the bass line and hollow drums permeating throughout the song. Bees in the Trap is notably less pop influenced than some of the other songs on Roman Reloaded. Nicki lets the beat and the lyrics speak for themselves, and the song doesn't get lost in the addition of too many of the maximalist electropop elements common at the time. In 2013, Beyonce dipped her toes into trap-inspired music with her songs Flawless, Drunk in Love, and 7-Eleven, all of which were on her self-titled album. Katy Perry's song Dark Horse, which features Juicy J, relies on a trap beat heavily composed of kick drums. Dark Horse was also extremely popular and is actually credited with helping cement trap music's place on the charts. Dark Horse went number one in the United States, was nominated for a Grammy, and was the best-selling song worldwide of 2014. 
On her album Art Pop, Lady Gaga's song Jewels and Drugs was trap inspired and included features from Twista, Too Short, and T.I. While this song wasn't as popular as Dark Horse or Flawless, Gaga herself is a mainstream artist with a massive following, and it shows even the biggest artists wanted a piece of the trap pie. Trap became even more popular and even more recognized by name when Fetty Wap released Trap Queen in 2015. Trap Queen peaked at number two on the Hot 100, and had those still none the wiser, googling what a trap queen was and by extension what a trap was. I think one of the more popular songs prior to reference trapping was definitely Bobby Smurda's song Hot Nigga, which made phrases like, if you ain't a hoe then get up out my trap house, a common joke among many a young adult and high schooler. This song was everywhere on the internet on apps like Vine, as its lyrical content didn't allow it to be played on most radios or TV stations. Still, because of other mean lyrics like about a week ago, as well as Bobby Shmurda's criminal behavior, it was still a hot topic on the internet. Speaking of which, the fact that so many of these songs went viral, either because of a meme or a trend, definitely helped Trap rise as well. Songs like Panda and Black Beatles didn't just become popular off their own merit, but also because of their virality. Not that they're bad songs, but for example, the fact that Panda had such an insane beat, yet such indecipherable lyrics made it into a meme. The Manic and Challenge helped popularize Black Beatles. I don't think there was a soul who was alive in 2016 who hasn't heard this song. Black Beatles was actually the first number one for Ray Swimmerd and Gucci Mane. The song was produced by Mike Will Made It, who has several other hip trap songs to his name. Some include Mercy, No Lie by 2 Chains, and Juicy J's Bands That Make Her Dance. From a pure production standpoint, trap is the perfect type of music to go viral because it's almost impossible to sit still when a trap song is on. It's also perfect music for parties and gatherings, which of course helps popularize it. Not to mention at this time, it was commonplace to use apps like Snapchat or Instagram all at events where this sort of music would be played, extending it even further. The only drawback of a certain genre of music going viral is that it often becomes commercialized and divorced from the context in which it was made. This then makes the sound of the music or its aesthetic appeal more valuable in a lot of spaces than the content of the music or what it represents. Though a lot of trap artists were still making music about actually trapping, many artists simply used the trap sound in their songs, making them sonically trap, but not lyrically. By the mid-2010s, trap was one of the, if not the most popular subgenres of hip-hop. I would consider trap's golden age to be between maybe 2014 and 2018, just because of the sheer amount of trap songs and albums released that were not only massively successful, but also distinct and innovative. The general public knew that they liked the trap sound, even if they didn't know what exactly it was or where it came from. This made it much easier for rappers to achieve a higher echelon of fame, so much so that their popularity began to rival that of many pop stars at the time. This might seem normal now, but decades ago, it was relatively unheard of for a hip-hop artists to be as popular as a pop star. Even when they were, it was few and far between rather than commonplace like it is now. Many of the big rappers at the time, from Young Thug to Future to Drake to Kodak Black, all either began their careers making trap music or increased their popularity by leaning into it. Young Thug is often credited as one of the rappers who pioneered modern trap music. The BBC actually named him the 21st century's most influential rapper. Young Thug hails from Atlanta, the birthplace of trap. He got a start back in 2010 and has since gained the attention of rappers like Gucci Mane and Rich Homie Kwan, his collaboration with the latter going viral for his garbled lyrics. In 2015, Young Thug released his debut mixtape, Barter 6. The mixtape received positive reviews, and it was called Cohesive, Visceral, and Passionate. Pitchfork rated it an 8.4 out of 10 and called it one of the best albums of 2015. The next year in 2016, Young Thug released three mixtapes, I'm Up, Slime Season 3, and Jeffrey. Young Thug was praised for his versatility and willingness to experiment, whether that meant singing on a track, yelling, ad-libbing, or overall employing the energy and dynamism that makes him so entertaining to listen to. Young Thug's slurred sounding lyrics and ad-libs became popular to the point where they influenced other artists like Travis Scott, Gunna, Playboy Cardi, and Future, all of which have named him as an influence. Future is also credited with influencing the sound of modern trap. The Atlanta native is often credited for introducing melodic elements into trap, both in the production and flow. 
Future's lyrics aren't confined and punctuated by his beats, rather he glides over them. Recently, Future said the key to success was finding out how to successfully transform trap music into pop music. In an interview with Apple Music, he mentioned that the majority of rap artists hadn't been making as much off of their music and tours as pop artists. His solution was to, in his words, make trap go pop. It wasn't quick for me, but everybody to come behind me is going to happen quick because yeah, I found the glitch to the matrix. I found the recipe. Once you find the recipe, then you got then it's just like it's just like trying to find a cure for Corona. Like I found the goddamn the cure to making this shit go pop. Traps going pop. Like whatever you're doing is going pop. Like you can be yourself and it's going pop. Like you can cross over too. You can get the same money as a pop star. By being yourself. You have you don't need have to do no corny. You just be yourself. And you get pop star money. At the end of the day, it's about man with these chicks talking about. Why we not getting this much money for these shows? We need to get a million dollars for a show. And you have. Of course. And of course, he's not talking about Britney Spears' Katy Perry bubblegum pop, but just pop enough to the point where the music can easily go mainstream. Future achieved this through the means of like making melodic trap music, as well as working with artists like Drake. And yes, as well as hip hop, a lot of Drake's music can be classified as pop. In 2015 alone, Future released two successful albums, DS2 and What a Time to Be Alive, his collaboration mixtape with Drake. DS2 had popular trap songs like F Up Some Commas, Real Sisters, and Where You At. In Real Sisters, for example, you can hear what Future was saying about adding more pop into trap. I think this is a more interesting piece of music than it gets credit for because it sounds like so many different things at once, but it meshes so well it might go unnoticed. You can hear the pop and the trap, of course, but I feel like you can hear a little crunk as well. Such is the genius of Zaytoven. I think Where You At, Lil One, and Groupies are still the standouts on the album for me, at least from a production standpoint. Most of the album was produced by Metro Boomin, who is quickly becoming one of Trap's best producers. Future's beats are complex in that, yes, they contain quintessential trap elements, but he's also going to add some other unexpected instrumentals or sounds to make it unique. They're anchored in trap, but still experimental. What a Time to Be Alive is no different. Metro Boomin executively produced the mixtape, with the project dropping just days after his 22nd birthday. Though the reviews are middling, the mixtape debuted at number one and produced hits like Diamonds Dancing, Big Rings, and Jump Man. Truly, it was a time to be alive. Trap was in full effect, and Drake and Future's chemistry was unmatched. Drake and Future promoted the mixtape as well as their own recent albums on their Summer 16 tour, which brought in nearly $100 million. In late 2015, Bryson Tiller gave us his debut album, Trap Soul. The album made it onto several year-end lists and was nominated for Billboard's Top R&B Album. As the title suggests, Trap Soul blended trap and R&B to create music that was rhythmic, calm, and emotional, yet still trap-influenced. The album's lead single, Don't, was originally released through SoundCloud and gained nearly 4 million listens in its first month. Despite the success of Trap Soul and its singles, Tiller received criticism for adding nothing new to the music, neither R&B nor trap. His music was said to have sounded too similar to other contemporaries like Drake and Jeremiah. I don't think that makes the music any less good though. It also points to how oversaturated the market was at the time and even the trap sound to an extent, especially mixing it with R&B. Other artists like Lil Yachty and Post Malone were gaining traction at this time too. Regardless, Trump Soul peaked at number 8 on the Hot 200 and has since been certified triple platinum. The album's also been praised for still holding up despite its release over 7 years ago. As far as Trap goes, the biggest debut album of 2015 goes to Rodeo hands down. Travis Scott's album debuted at number 3 on the Hot 100 and made use of producers like Pharrell, Kanye, and Metro Boomin, though Scott headed the production. Rodeo had features from some of the trap greats like Future, 2 Chainz, Young Thug, Sway Lee, and Chief Keef. I feel like memory bias is at play here because I remember this album being a huge, critically acclaimed thing. But looking back on some of the reviews, most of them treated the album like it was average at best. Rolling Stone gave Rodeo 3 out of 5 stars, and Pitchfork rated it a 6 out of 10. Many reviews praised the album's originality, but grappled with it simultaneously being overproduced and feeling like Travis had more to offer, which had been clouded by the several guest spots on the album. All Music's review of Rodeo stated, Rodeo's back end after Antidote begins to mesh together and gets repetitive. Nonetheless, the originality of Scott's sound within this new movement provides for a strong rookie effort, leaving the listener excited for a career that is just getting started. 
Rodeo did make it on several year-end lists, including complexes, which stated Rodeo was full of undeniable bangers. It seems like the consensus was that Rodeo at the very least did leave people eager to see what else Travis Scott had to offer as he grew. And grow he did. His sophomore album, Birds in the Trap, Sing McKnight, debuted at number one. It was supported by three singles, Wonderful, Pick Up the Phone, and its most popular single, Goosebumps, featuring Kendrick Lamar. The album's reviews generally weren't much kinder this time around, but several were positive. In their review, Pitchfork said, Birds in the Trap Sing McKnight escapes as Travis Scott's best work yet, a combination of elevated significance, self-awareness, and the old trick of spinning something so plain into something so luxurious. Regardless of the reviews, Travis Scott quickly grew a cult following. I think this is why I was kind of surprised by the reviews. But I'm assuming the majority of people regularly listening to Travis Scott and Trap in general aren't typically the same demographic writing these reviews. And when we can stream music ourselves for free, music reviews really aren't the be-all end-all when it comes to an artist's popularity. Down in the comments, let me know where you were when you first heard the lyrics, Raindrop, Drop Top. I'm sure you remember, because the timeline shifted when that song came out. Nothing was the same. I still can't explain it. But Trap itself can't be explained without talking about the Migos, a rap trio from Lawrenceville, Georgia. In late 2016, they released Bad and Bougie as the lead single off their second album, Culture. Bad and Bougie was also produced by Metro Boomin, who would become a longtime collaborator of the Migos. The Migos had been a trio since 2008 and had been related since they were all born and had other popular trap songs to their name like Versace, Hannah Montana, Fight Night, and Look at My Dab. The success of Bad and Bougie was unlike that of any of their other previous songs, though. A couple months after the song's release, Bad and Bougie shot up to the top 10 on Billboard and then went number one, earning Metro Boomin and Migos their first number one. Some of the reasons for Bad and Bougie's virality include the memes that came from the Raindrop Drop Top lyric and the Lil Uzi feature. People were also shocked to find out through an interview that later became a meme that Takeoff wasn't even on Bad and Bougie. I ain't left out Bad and Bougie. You think I'm left out Bad and Bougie? Say again? You say I'm left off Bad and Bougie? Uh, what'd you say? You say I'm left off Bad and Bougie? Yeah. Do it look like I'm left off Bad and Bougie? What'd you say? Do it look like I'm left off Bad and Bougie? And if you were a girl and didn't caption at least one of your Instagram pics with Bad and Bougie, then you might as well have just been ugly back then. Childish Gambino later shouted out the song at the Golden Globes. Gambino would also lean into Trap in his song This Is America, which was his first number one single. Beyond what it meant for the Migos, the success of Bad and Bougie even further proved Trump's dominance in the mainstream and even its acceptance as legitimate popular music. 2017 was full of excellent releases as far as Trap goes. Future gave us a self-titled album as well as Hendrix. Gucci Mane gave us two albums, Migos dropped Culture, and Princess Nokia dropped her debut album, 1992. Songs like Tomboy, Katana, and Flava are best described as controlled chaos, with Nokia displaying her skill and bravado over blaring trap beats. A year after the success of Bad and Bougie, Migos released their third album, Culture 2. The album included several popular artists at the time, including Travis Scott, Nicki Minaj, 2 Chainz, Cardi B, and Gucci Mane, all of which had trap songs under their belt prior. Though Quavo executive produced the album, Metro Boomin, Pharrell, and Kanye West all had producing credits on Culture 2. Stir Fry has a more pop sound to it, and it's undeniably Pharrell, although the lyrics refer directly to trapping. The song was so popular that despite its subject matter, it was still used for many ads. Drake featured on Walk It Like I Talk It, another single used to promote the album. The lead single, Motorsport, is probably most notable for being the only song that Cardi and Nicki have together. The beat is secure, yet punching, and provides the perfect vehicle, no pun intended, for the ensemble of artists to rap over. Cardi's verse on Motorsport is actually my favorite Cardi verse of all time. I don't know if that's an unpopular opinion, but I'm gonna assume that it is. Though none of the singles on Culture 2 went number one, Stir Fry, Motorsport, and Walk It Like I Talk It were all top 10, and the album itself did go number one. In 2018, 2 Chainz released his album, Pretty Girls Like Trap Music. Mike Will Made It was one of the producers, and it included features from Quavo, Pharrell, Nicki Minaj, Travis Scott, and Sway Lee. The most popular single from the album was It's a Vibe, featuring Ty Dolla Sign, Trey Songz, and Janae Aiko. The single only peaked at number 44 on the charts, so despite its popularity, it wasn't a commercial success. The album, however, did peak at number 2 on the Hot 200, and was considered by some to be 2 Chainz's best album to date. Pitchfork noted that the album had a more minimalistic take on Trap, 
especially compared to the previous trap wave led by artists like Lex Luger and Waka Flocka. I think this is true of a lot of the trap-influenced music of the time, especially with other works I mentioned like Trap Soul. That same year, Beyonce and Jay-Z released their own trap-influenced album, Everything Is Love. They released the joint project as the Carters, obviously because they're married. Everything Is Love contains several other different genres of music, from contemporary R&B to pop to rap. Yet on the track Ape Shit, Beyonce steps into trap again and clearly has fun doing it. Jay-Z also raps on the Pharrell-produced track, supported by the Migos and their ad-libs. Other honorable mentions on the album are Nice and Friends, which have a slower, more so-called traditional take on trap. Trap was so popular that the majority of rappers who debuted at this time made sure their debut song had trap elements. One of the most notable examples is, of course, Cardi B's major label debut, Bodak Yellow. The song interpolates Kodak Black's No Flockin'. The Washington Post and Pitchfork both named Bodak Yellow the best song of 2017. It topped the charts for three weeks, and Cardi also became the first female rapper to have a solo song certified diamond by the RAAA. Bodak Yellow has been said to have a more New York take on a trap beat, rather than a southern one, which is more typical since trap originated in the South. Now that I've established how rappers built trap into its massive heights in the mid to late 2010s, I want to go back to talking about its influence on the rest of music. Since trap was extremely popular and profitable, several pop artists wanted to make trap-inspired music and often included features from rappers. Trap was extremely popular with pop artists, like I mentioned earlier with Beyonce and Katy Perry. I think a more infamous example is Miley Cyrus and her bangers era. Before the album dropped, Miley released her single 23. The song had all the makings of a trap song, from a Mike Will beat to a Juicy J feature. Unlike Katy Perry, though, Miley didn't leave the rapping to Juicy J. Wiz Khalifa also features on 23 for some reason. Unlike several other trap pop songs of the era, 23 wasn't well received. No one took the song seriously, but because so many people were intrigued by Miley's hood era, it did peak at number 11 on Billboard. Trap also became popular among several EDM producers at the time like Diplo, DJ Snake, Yellow Claw, Bauer, and Run The Jewels. This music of course sounded more electronic and computerized than traditional trap and became popular in festivals and dance house scenes. However, on several occasions, these songs went viral and became popular with the general public. Examples include Bauer's Harlem Shake and DJ Snake and Lil Jon's Turn Down For What. Typically though, this type of music is distinguished from more hip hop based trap by calling it either EDM trap or festival trap. In 2015, Azealia Banks featured on The Kids Aren't Alright, a song for Fall Out Boy's 2015 album Make America Psycho Again. The entire album was remixed songs from their previous album, American Beauty, American Psycho, with features on every track. The Migos and Zaytoven actually feature on the Irresistible remix, and Zaytoven produced the Twin Skeletons remix. So yes, even Fall Out Boy was into trap at the time and included it on one of their albums. Though she dabbles in several types of hip-hop, Azalea's already proved the year prior that she could hold her own on a trap song with Ice Princess. Ice Princess is still one of the hardest trap songs I've heard, and it makes me sad that so many people haven't heard it. That little continuous chime that peeks out from under the beat gives me a chill every time. I didn't really understand what was meant by Bodak Yellow having a New York trap beat, but I can hear it in Ice Princess as well. The beat is stripped down to the essential elements to set the tone, and it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of Southern trap. For example, when the song torpedoes into the bridge, we lose the beat that sits with us through the verses because it's just not necessary and can hinder from focusing on the new elements added to the song. In the later 2010s, the artist most known for combining trap and pop was definitely Ariana Grande. She debuted the sound in 2015 when she dropped her Christmas and Chill album. The album blended wintry vocals, sleigh bells, and trap beats to make some hip hop inspired Christmas carols. Examples include December and With It This Christmas. Rolling Stone described Christmas and Chill's content as romantic Christmas ballads over trap beats. Ariana used the sound again for a 2018 album Sweetener in songs like Every Time, the title track Sweetener, and God Is A Woman, which was said to have a chilly, hypnotic trap beat. Rolling Stone claimed that with Sweetener, Ariana proved that trap was the new pop. For the album, she won a Grammy for Best Pop Vocal Album. To further prove the popularity of trap pop, even Taylor Swift, who was the epitome of pop at the time, had released Endgame, a trap-influenced song featuring Ed Sheeran and Future. Ariana leaned even further into the trap sound with her next album, Thank You Next. The album contained trap, R&B, and pop to make some of the most viral, unique, and layered pop songs of 2018. 
In Seven Rings, Ariana combines show tunes and trap beats to make a sassy female empowerment anthem. The song debuted at number one in the Hot 100 and broke a streaming record on Spotify the day it debuted. It gained nearly 15 million streams in its first day and 70 million in its first week. Seven Rings was a viral smash and earned Ariana two Grammy nominations. The next single, Break Up With Your Girlfriend On Board, is the flirty trap pop anthem in which Ariana's voice floats over the beat. It debuted at number two on the Hot 100, joining Thank You Next and Seven Rings in the top three spots. On songs like Make Up, Fake Smile, and In My Head, the trap production creates a vibe of both assertion and forcefulness from Ariana, yet simultaneously one of coyness and calmness. Her airy voice and the heavy trap beat juxtapose each other, but the instrumental usually throws in some other instruments like strings or piano to balance things out. The trap-influenced songs are made by a number of producers from Tommy Brown to Max Martin to Martin Alia. Thank You Next went double platinum and received four Grammy nominations. Ariana again used the trap and R&B sound on her 2020 album Positions. Again, the album was characterized by a combination of R&B, trap, and pop, as well as string instruments and self-harmonies. Aside from the title track, it's evident in songs like Just Like Magic, a trap play song about manifesting one's goals, as well as Nasty and 630. 34 plus 35 mostly has a playful and quirky beat, save for the faint trap beat tying everything down, assisted by some piano and strings. Again, Ariana's voice nearly seems to float off, save by the trap beat tethering down the song when she's either very sure of herself or confronting someone else. Position spent two weeks at number one in the Hot 100, and the album has since been certified platinum. Other than Ariana, another artist used trap to create a song that took the world by storm. In his debut single, Old Town Road, Lil Nas X expertly blended country and trap, putting a creative spin on something that had been a trend for almost a decade at this point. Aside from pop, Old Town Road is considered a country trap song, two genres so far from each other that blending them contributed to the intrigue of the song. The song actually samples the beginning of a Nine Inch Nails song, 34 Ghost 4. But Lil Nas adds a trap beat to it, one full of 808s and kick drums that he actually bought online for $30. He leans into the banjo sounds from the Nine Inch Nails sample and plays on them to make the song sound country. Old Town Road is the fastest song in history to reach Diamond certification and the song that spent the most time at number one on the Hot 100. Around 2020, conversations began about whether trap was dying or simply declining. Like I said previously, music was becoming oversaturated with the trap sound from hip hop to pop to R&B. After 10 years of a sound being everywhere, there are only so many new takes on it that can be done. Artists like Future, The Migos, DaBaby, and Gunna were still releasing trap music, but as a whole, there was a noticeable decline in its quality and popularity. After 10 years in the spotlight, trap had shifted away from its roots and the sound that was popularized by artists like Jeezy, Gucci Mane, and T.I. when it first hit the mainstream. Now trap was commercialized and arguably watered down by nearly every artist using the sound at some point or other. Not only that, several of the trap albums released at the time not only sounded repetitive, but had way too many songs on them. For example, Future's latest album, I Never Liked You, has 22 songs on it. His previous album, High on Life, has 20 songs. Culture 2, which I mentioned earlier, has a whopping 24 songs on it, while Culture 3 has 19. Young Thug's most recent project, Punk, is 20 songs long. This is a far cry from reviews of his mixtape Slime Season 3, which said that each track was carefully chosen, its inclusion was justified, and left listeners wanting more. In addition to an album that already feels too long, several artists released deluxe versions that either added more songs or felt like an entirely different project. Instead of albums of the past leaving mediocre songs on the cutting room floor, some of these projects feel like every single song recorded made onto the album, and many of them are skips. Regardless, trap isn't dead, and I don't think that the genre will ever completely die. After all, it's been the lens through which an entire generation has shaped their concept of hip-hop, so I don't think it's going to suddenly disappear. For years, trap has evolved and crossed over into several genres, which I'm sure will continue to do in the 2020s. Some of the newer genres born from trap include emo trap, psychedelic trap, and trap metal. With the release of Astroworld back in 2018, Travis Scott veered into a new form of trap that's been called psychedelic trap. It's characterized by electronic, EDM-sounding beats that give off a trippy, disorienting vibe similar to hallucinating. The beats almost sound liquid at points and slip and slide around the bass line. Some other examples include Highest in the Room, Do What I Want, Futures Crushed Up, and Mile High, a collaboration between Travis Scott, James Blake, and Metro Boomin. 
Trap metal, as the name suggests, blends trap music with elements of rock and metal. Rico Nasty is a perfect example of trap metal. A good bit of her discography is trap or pop trap. Still, many of her songs combine trap and metal in equal parts, creating songs that are as chaotic and rage-inducing as they are fun. Some examples include Smack a Bitch, Vaders, and Black Punk. Rico also has her own unique sound, which she calls Sugar Trap, which is a mix of trap, punk, and pop with lyrics that are sweet and bubbly at some times and razor sharp at others. Sugar Trap is... Dad, I'm hot, I know. But, um, Sugar Trap is like, this meets like, you know what I'm saying, gutter shit, AKs, Rubis, 30s, all that crazy shit, shit you don't ever wanna see, purge shit. It's just the blend, just the mixture of both. Uh, I love trap, I love trap music, all that, but, uh, I feel like I'm too, I'm too happy for that. A genre I was kind of surprised to hear derived from trap is hyperpop. Hyperpop is often characterized by its incoherent and unrelenting loudness, and the best way I can describe it is sensory overload. Hyperpop combines elements from several genres from EDM to bubblegum pop to dance house to trap. Hyperpop relies on the more surreal experimental sounds that entered hip-hop in the mid-2010s, thanks in large part to trap. By definition, hyperpop is noisy, which can make it a perfect complement to trap music, which can be equally noisy. Some examples of hyperpop that include rap are Rico Nasi's iPhone, 100 Gex's Ringtone Remix, and Slater's Daddy AF. Since hyperpop is still more pop than hip hop, a lot of hyperpop songs don't have rap in them if they have lyrics at all. Still, the trap inspiration is present. A great example is Charlie XCX's Vroom Vroom. This is quintessential hyperpop, but the trap influence is ever present, and more so when the chorus drops. Charlie actually has several songs like this, others being Claws, Roll With Me, and Five in the Morning. Some other examples are 100 Gex's Money Machine, and honestly the majority of the music made by Namasenda and That Kid. Like Rico Nasty, I feel like Ash Nico exists in both the trap metal and hyperpop worlds. Most of her songs are classified as trap pop, with hyperpop elements being present. Similar to Rico, Ash Nico's delivery makes you think she should be the front woman of a punk band, but her voice works perfectly to supersede the packed production in her music. In her songs, she often switches between rapping, singing, and yelling, whichever gets the message across best. Ash Nico's more trap-influenced songs like Daisy, Halloweeny, Toxic, and Innards are brash and noisy, and are stellar examples of how a trap beat can quickly transform into a chaotic but catchy hyperpop song. Ashniko's music makes clear the relations between hyperpop and trap, and how one influenced the other. Other songs like Deal With It and Good While It Lasted are slightly more tame in nature, but still fall into that trap pop category. Songs like Tantrum lean into the trap metal sound. Cry, which features Grimes, leans into trap metal too, with some hyperpop sprinkled in, of course, because it's Grimes. Now that I've absolutely talked your ears off about how trap dominated 2010s music, I do want to take a look at some genres that might have a similar impact moving into the 2020s. However, I'm not going to be the one to explain things this time. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to my boy, Nathy. Just like how trap has influenced the entire music landscape of the entire 2010s, I feel like other genres are also doing the same for music. And I predict it's about to even surpass trap music's influence in the future. I'm Nathy, by the way, check my channel out. It's going to be a hub for pop culture videos in the future, so go to my channel after watching this video. Anyways, if trap was for the 2010s, then I feel like there are certain genres which will take over the 2020s. R&B is a genre that has slowly been integrating itself into pop for a while now. A lot of people actually thought that R&B would slowly die as the 2000s went on, and it kind kinda did. R&B was a top genre for a while and then it took a backseat during the 2010s for pop and hip-hop. One of the reasons why R&B has persisted so long is because of its ability to adapt to current music trends. Modern R&B has remained highly innovative. Over the recent decades, R&B has transformed from a genre with one distinct soulful sound into one with many divergent offshoots based on evolving vocal techniques, star power, and musical fusions. This is partly one of the reasons why R&B is not only making a comeback in the 2020s, I predict it's about to be the new backbone of music for the coming years, but I fear it won't ever get the recognition for it. Let me explain. The thing about R&B mixing into pop itself is that it has been going on for a couple of years now. Pop as a genre takes a lot of cues from the modern music trends. Khalifa Sane, in her book, Major Label, makes the point that R&B was significantly co-opted by pop and indie in the last several decades. You can specifically see this pattern during the start of the 2020s when multiple pop artists started releasing albums with a significantly R&B flavor to it. I think the most significant is Ariana's Positions album, which took a considerably more pop R&B route than her previous trap pop-infused Thank You Next album. Positions, the single, is a perfect example 
example of this. Ariana perfectly mixes R&B with her more pop sound, creating an infectious hook and rhythm taken from pop with the vocal tenacity and smooth instrumentals of R&B. Justin Bieber also releases infamous Yummy Yum, the Yummy Yum, the Yummy Yummy, alongside his fifth studio album Changes. The single and the album were both heavily influenced by R&B, and this genre blending even led to some controversy when Changes and Yummy was nominated in the pop categories. Justin said in a statement that he set out to make an R&B album. Changes was and is an R&B album, and I think this is one of the reasons that even if R&B gets a renaissance and becomes the backbone of 2020s music, it probably won't get its recognition because of just the confusion and unclearness of what constitutes music as R&B. There are other mainstream R&B artists like SZA, Summer Walker, Frank Ocean, Khalid, whose music is undeniably R&B. It's really all about perspective here. As the Y2K in early 2000s has made its comeback in the 2020s, fashion for example, I feel like music trends of that time is slowly starting to come back as well. And R&B was a top girly at that period, so its comeback is inevitable. And though I think now R&B infused records are kind of taking a dive in popularity and quantity because it's being overshadowed by another trend that we will talk about later, but I'm sure at some point it will come back because who does not like R&B? Another comeback that I and a lot of people have noticed is dance, specifically disco and house. Disco is a genre of dance music and a subculture that emerged in the 1970s from the United States urban nightlife scene. Its sound is typified by four on the floor beats, syncopated bass lines, string sections, horns, electric piano, synthesizers, and electric rhythm guitars. Disco saw a huge boom in specifically the year 2020, with numerous songs using disco as a bass and inspiration for them. Say So by Doja Cat is a pop disco record that dominated TikTok and the internet, and later on the charts after a remix with Nicki Minaj. This was the track that really made Doja Cat mainstream, and we can say because of this, she was one of the innovators of disco having a resurgence in current music. The Weeknd also pioneered disco-infused pop music with his album After Hours, his monstrous single, Blinding Lights. It also has electro-pop and synth-pop influences, and it does take a lot from the 70s and 80s as a whole. Future Nostalgia is another big album in 2020 that is a heavily pop disco album. This album is actually one of my favorite albums of the 2020s so far. Like, that album really has a grip on my soul. Anyways, disco-inspired music was at the top of music, but then it was dethroned by another dance subgenre that has been bubbling below disco, waiting for its return, house music. House is a music genre characterized by a repetitive four-on-the-floor beat and a typical tempo of 120 beats per minute, also high kicks. It was created by DJs and music producers from Chicago's underground club culture in the late 70s as DJs began altering disco songs to give them a more mechanical beat. So house does bear some similarities with disco, but there's a distinct sound for house that differs from disco. I think the most recent notable release with a heavily house sound is Renaissance by Beyonce. Beyonce sought inspiration in post 1970s black dance music and club culture. She wanted the album to be a celebration of the underappreciated pioneers of dance music, whose contributions has been unrecognized in the mainstream. Beyonce said, We are all ready to escape travel, love, and laugh again. I feel a renaissance emerging, and I want to be part of nurturing that escape in any way possible. Yeah, and I think a big reason for dance music in general becoming so popular is because after the pandemic, people just want to dance. We want to have fun. We want to escape from the past years we have. Renaissance is probably one of my favorite albums of the year. I feel like it was a return to the fun Beyonce we've been missing for a long time. Our foodie sister Drake also notably surprised released his house rap infused album, Honestly Never Mind. To be honest, I haven't really listened to this album. I just don't like and get Drake that much. Unpopular opinion I know, like Sticky and Jimmy Cooks, have the house sound, and I think he pulls it off. Even earlier than these projects, Chromatic already had a clear dance sound, with house and disco fused into one another. And there have been a plethora of dance albums throughout the years that have led us to this point. So many new releases have this house sound now, and I feel like it will be the new sound of the future. So now, I want to give it back to Miss Naomi Cannibal. You're living up to your name. You've been eating this video up. Go check my channel out after watching this video. Hope you enjoyed my part. And yeah, back to you, Naomi. Trap music is arguably the genre that influenced 2010s music the most. It's impressive to look back and see how one genre influenced the majority of popular music for a decade. We don't just have rappers to thank for developing trap, but also producers like Lex Luger, Mike Will Made It, Zaytoven, and Metro Boomin. I think it's also great to see that it wasn't just pop singers who profited off trap once it became popular. Trap artists who helped create and evolve the sound were also able to succeed and profit too, and essentially create an era where hip hop was pop music. And this by no means was only happening in the United States, even though I focused on American music for this video. Trap has influenced several genres of music from other countries, from K-pop to Latin trap, which originated in Puerto Rico. Doing this video made me realize how much I appreciate trap music, especially from the mid-2010s. Those were my teenage years and early 20s, and without trap, some of the songs I heard at my happiest and at my saddest wouldn't exist. We have trap to thank for so many of the decade's most popular songs across several genres, and that's a remarkable legacy. I'm gonna leave you guys something to debate with in the comments. 
Do y'all consider Kendrick Lamar to be trapped? Personally, I don't, but I saw a lot of people saying that he was online. He's hip hop, he's a rapper, but I wouldn't really consider him trapped. But thank you guys so much for watching, and I really do hope you enjoyed this video because this was a really fun one to make. Definitely be sure to like and subscribe so that you can stick around. Thanks again, Nathy, for sharing your thoughts with us. We enjoyed you. Love you dolls. See you guys very, very soon. Bye-bye.